If you have your Bibles, I'm going to go to Proverbs 14 and 12. And if you're able, if you're physically able, I prefer we stand for the reading of the word. I'll just read this one and I'll let you be seated. But I promise you I'll stay standing up here and I'll read a couple more verses. Proverbs 14 and 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, ain't that just a revolting development? <laughs> Jesus, Lord, we need you today. I don't know if anybody else here needs you, Lord, but I know I do. I need your help, your unction, your anointing, and anything and everything else you might be able to send my way today. I love you. I'm thankful. I'm blessed. Help me, Lord, to bring forth this thought to your beloved. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Before you're seated, don't go wandering around, but just fist bump someone by you. I'm glad you're in church with me today. And then you can be seated. Amen. Don't go too far because at the end of this thing, I'm having you come up and it needs to be a good song. Worship and get to the good point. Don't, don't go the long way. John 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. I don't want to give the date or the time or the year because I guess it'll really date myself even though I guess I'm thankful that I've been able to live this long and get this old. And I just don't like what's come with it. The blindness, the baldness, the belliness. Just... Can I get an amen for many people got a few years under your belt? I won't say the name of the group, but Roger Hodgson spoke of a song that they wrote. Take the long way home. He said the song works on two levels. It's talking about not wanting to go home to the wife. So take the long way home to the wife because she treats you like a part of the furniture. <laughs> but there's another level to the song too. We all want to find our home. We all want to find that place where we feel at home. Now, if you remember last week's message, I do not want to detract from that in any way. In fact, I think I want to punctuate it and let you know that we're not home yet. It might seem like we're taking a long way home, but that's okay. God's been known to do that before. 1 Corinthians 10 says, More other brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. Wait, in the Old Testament? Yeah. For those of you that struggle, you need a revelation. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. I do want to take a few moments today to speak for you on the subject of the long way home. The long way home. One writer said, the very desire to find shortcuts makes us imminently unsuited for any kind of mastery. You can't shortcut success. Some time back, we were on our way back from Missouri, and we had gone to uh, a restaurant, some friends, and then we wanted to get to the freeway and drive a few hours and get to a hotel room. And 
We wanted to get a few miles under our belt. And in my manliness, decided to take a shortcut to the freeway. But there's really no shortcuts in misery, or excuse me, Missouri. It was a huge mistake. It was raining. The roads were slick. The roads were treacherous. The danger of deer, and coyotes, and possums and raccoons, I mean, not being able to not avoid them and careening off the road into a ditch and crashing into a tree and bursting into flames Kate, laid heavy on my mind. <laughs> Needless to say, by the time we got to the freeway, we forgot about getting any more time and we just thought a hotel. It took us way too long. So I want to grab a portion of scripture. It's very familiar. I tried so hard to get away from this because I wanted to preach something different. But, you know, sometimes in our humanity, we kind of need to do what God wants us to do. <laughs> I want to step in the middle of that great drama of redemption as it plays out in the Exodus story. After 400 years of captivity, Israel finally cries out to God, and he's heard them. And in the fullness of his time, he sent forth a deliverer named Moses. Now understand, there's a lot of interesting characters in this drama. If we're not careful, you might come to the conclusion that the main character is Moses. But that's a mistake. Because the main story, the main character in the story, in this one, as well as ours, is God. He's the Redeemer. He's the Deliverer. He's the one who makes the way where there seems to be no way. He's the one that hears our cry. He's the one who heard Israel's cry. He, he was the one who hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now that's a paradox in itself, and if you're familiar with the Bible, you'll know that God is delivering Israel, but he purposely hardens Pharaoh's heart so he wouldn't let him go. To, to us, it's like, well, why would God do that? Let me tell you why. Because he knows more than we do. Can I help you? He knows more than you. Stop thinking you got God cornered and you, you, you're this omniscient being. You're not. He is. It's he, it's he that is the one that breaks the yoke of Egypt and brings his people out from among them. God is not merely a character in the story. God is not just a part of the drama that was unfolding. He, he's the author and the finisher of it. For those of you to read, you hear us often say, he is the author and the finisher of my faith. It's God who leads them out of Egypt. It's God who leads us out of our Egypt. You got to be careful to keep the perspective right. We sometimes think that we're making all the decisions and pulling all the strings. but I want to say that my story's in his hands. He's not just the author, he's my author. I want him directing my step, ordering my steps. Exodus 13, beginning at 17, says, Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. It was quicker. It's a shorter way. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. God took the long way on purpose. He purposely took them the way you and I wouldn't go. I, I, I hate to break it to you, and, and one of the biggest frustrations in life is riding with someone who doesn't know the shortest way somewhere. Right? 
Some of you are fighting battles God never intended simply because you wouldn't trust his direction, so you've gone your own. Because the shortest way is not always the right way. God knows the best way. The destination was to the north. God took them south. You see, we wouldn't do that. But remember, God's ways aren't our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. His wisdom makes us look foolish. But the struggle is, is just we think we know better. There was a road to the Canaan land from Egypt called the Coastal Highway. But against everybody's GPS, against everybody's Rand McNally's map, anybody remember those things? Against everybody's map quest. Remember printing those out before you went on a trip? I can just see Cora right now. What are you doing, Moses? See, you're wrong, pal. You're wrong. We can go right there. No, no, God said this way. So always someone knows better than the pastor. Always someone knows better than the church. I don't need to try to. Yeah. <laughs> Your shortcuts are costing you, pal. God went against everything they thought they knew. God didn't take the fastest or most convenient route. God purposely led them instead into the wilderness. Some were overthrown in the wilderness. They just couldn't simply walk in step with the Lord. But the highway is shorter, God. It's shorter. It's quicker over here, Pastor. That way's a whole lot simpler. You don't understand. I'm bypassing the land of the Philistines. I know that way would be the most direct route, looking at it from Israel's point of view. It's got to be the easiest way, God. Let's go that way. But listen closely. As God directs your path and orders your way, sometimes he's going to see you and know your frame, know your makeup, know what would happen if you won't go that way. He says, let's, let's take the long way today. Some of you struggle when it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to give to get. It doesn't make sense to turn the other cheek. It doesn't make sense to go the extra mile. The ways of God don't make sense to us. But if you didn't stop and think about what's going on in the world, I guess we can see, you know, God's way is a whole lot better. See, some people struggle when it doesn't make sense. But understand, you can't see what God sees and you don't know what God knows. That's why it's important to be a spiritual person. That's why it's important to be a person of the word. Because you have to trust that God already knows and you have to trust what God is already doing. God could see what they couldn't see. God knew what they didn't know. He looked that way and saw a war, and they were not prepared for war. He looked that way and saw a battle that would cause them to lose hope. He, he looked that way and said, no. And it was the grace of God that said, I know that way seems better, but my grace is sufficient. Let's go this way. That's the provision of God. It was the mercy of God that made them take the long way home. That's important because the way God takes them will also challenge their faith. I'm not saying God will take you an easy way. I'm saying God will take you the right way. There's a difference. How many have done it your way? I can't remember. Oh, what was the name? Sinatra, whoever. I did it my way. Yeah, look how that worked out, pal. Yeah. But I know I can trust him. In fact, I can trust God better than I can trust myself. And even though I think I know this and I can solve all these mysteries, or I think, I, you know what? I still just want to do it God's. God knew what his people could handle. He knew what they couldn't handle. And he knew what they needed. And they needed to take the long way. I wish I could say that as a believer, 
as a simple Christian man, that this whole walking with God thing has been easy for me. It hasn't. I wish I could tell you that living for God, oh man, it's a fire escape from problems. <laughs> but there is one thing that does make it easier, and it's something that Job teaches us. In Job 23 and 10, he gives us some insight that we all need to know. It says, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. You see, Job was struggling with the fact that he couldn't understand everything that was going on. He couldn't understand the way life had turned. And he couldn't understand the way God was taking him. As a matter of fact, if we're real, I'm pretty sure there were times he couldn't see God at all in any direction. I believe everywhere he looked, he could not find or see in his circumstances anything that resembled what he thought God would be doing for him. But Job takes consolation from two things that I think would help us. First, he declares, God knows the way that I take. And not only does he know the way that I take, he knows exactly where I am. That lets me know he has not forgotten me or abandoned me. I don't know where you're at, what you're going through mentally, emotionally, physically, physically, geologically, wherever you are. But I can tell you, God knows exactly where you are and what you need. God is still sovereign. And when you finally get to that place that you'll allow God to be sovereign, let God be true and every man a liar. It may be the long way home, but it's still the best way. And when he has tested you, you shall come forth. You shall come forth. You see, when you finally get to that place that God is sovereign, I'm going to serve him over anything else. When you finally get there emotionally, spiritually, just when it just becomes your, your fiber of who you're going to be, that no matter what's going on, good or bad, I set my face, face like a flint. And like, 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 like the disciple that responded to Jesus when he asked, will you go away? To whom shall we go? In other words, I made up my mind. When you get there, you'll be a formidable, unbeatable saint of God. You'll be undeterred. You will not be a, a person that's tossed about because Job declares, I shall come forth. There's no doubt that Job believes God and that God will bring him through. <laughs> there may be some scars. That I shall come forth. There may be some struggles, but let me just note, note to all and everybody right now, I will come out of this. I may, it may, my journey may look rough. Uh, I may be going up the rough side of the mountain, but understand who's ordered my steps. Uh, I will come forth. And when I come out of this, I'm going to be refined like pure gold. I may not understand why I'm walking the long road. I may not understand why I'm taking the long way home. But this I know, if the Lord directs my path, I will come forth. He will bring me home. I will get to my destination. Yes, it may be difficult. It may have challenges. It may have problems. But the road the Lord has me on will take me right where he wants me, and I know he would, that none would perish, but that all, oh, oh, I don't know about who. It may be the long way. It may be the difficult path, but Lord, order my steps, because I know where you want to take me. Oh, let's give the Lord a hand, pray. Look at someone who thinks they're on the long way and say, hey, it's still the best way. God knows the best way to get you home. God knows the best way to go.
It may not be the fastest way, but it's still the best way. In fact, this, it's nothing new. In fact, this, this subtle thread is throughout the Word of God. In fact, God warned New Testament Joseph. He says in Matthew 2, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in dreams, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. What? We just got out of there. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy it. Can I tell you, if God knows what's up then, he knows what's up now. If he knew what was going on back then, he knows what's going on in your life right now. It may look bad. It may look long. But I know God is with us. I'm coming out of this. I will make my way out of this. As God orders my steps, I will move forward and come out of this. I may not understand. But this I know, if the Lord, if I'll yield to the Lord and he directs my path, this road will bring me home. There may be some brokenness. There may be some difficulties. It'll have its challenges. But this road will take me right where he wants me to be. You need to turn to your name and say, God knows the best way home. Not only does God know which way is best, but he walks that way with us. Exodus 13 tells us, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. It may have been a long road, but his presence was with them all along that long road. God went with them on that journey. You see, you're not alone in this thing. If you'll let him and if you'll obey him and you'll let him order your steps, by day, the Lord was a cloud over them, sheltering them from the sun. And when the sun went down, he was a pillar of fire before them, warming them in the coolness of that desert night. You see, God never took his presence away. God hasn't forgotten you. God hasn't abandoned anybody. You see, he's on this journey with you. The road may not be easy. But just know your helper is walking with you. The way may be difficult. But the provider of all providers is walking right beside you. You see, you got to remember that God is keeping you safe from a battle you're not ready for. Oh, I want to go this way, this all, but there's a battle there you're not ready for. There's, see, one of the worst things we can do is ever bypass the process. See, if you'll bleed, if you'll uh, sweat in preparation, you won't bleed in battle. Y'all, y'all need to write that one down. The problem with some of you, you know, yeah, why can't I get this thing? Well, where's your prayer life? I'm not talking that mumble a few things under your breath on your way driving down the road. What do you know of his word? Are you really reading his word? I'm not just talking about a little daily devotional they send you on your phone and you get a few little nice little scriptures. I'm talking about getting in his word. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I was pleasantly surprised the other night I was out to dinner with a couple of our elders and uh, man, I'm ahead on reading my Bible this year. I was like, yeah. How many of you ahead on your Bible reading this year? Don't answer. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they may turn and camp before Piha he wrote. It'll make sense here in a minute. Between Migdol and the sea, opposite Belsephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. Now why did I read you all those places? Well, give me a minute, I'll tell you why. Not only does God send them the long way home, he tells Moses to take a detour into a very unlikely place. 
You see, I'm pretty sure, just like you and I, they were already prepared and wanting their freedom. But God said, let's wait right here and let the enemy catch up. <laughs> the precise location is actually unknown. The sea, of course, is the Red Sea. But the Migdol means tower. It's pretty likely that it referred to a fort, and in that part of country, it would be an Egyptian fort. And most likely, Piha he wrote, was possibly an opening in Egypt's canal system, opening into the Red Sea, while Bel Siphon may have been a reference to a place of worship. That really doesn't tell us much. Without an ancient map, we'd hard pressed to find the exact location and place. But that's really not the point. Wherever they were, the Israelites were completely vulnerable. God wanted them vulnerable. God was doing a setup. They were out of Egypt's frontier, surrounded by desert. They had their backs to the sea, and they had no defenses. They were not in a condition for a military campaign. Yet, that's exactly where God wanted them. If you're feeling a little helpless, if you feel like the devil's just got you cornered, I want to remind you, like Job, he knows the way that you take. And the enemy's got you right where God wants you. Exodus 14 says, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, this is what the enemy's going to say about you. They are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Are you hearing me? So that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Let me tell you. You're trying to make sense of everything going on in your life. And God saying, if you let me do this in your life, I'll get glory. That's what God is doing in your life. It's the exact same thing he was doing with Job. It's the same thing that he's doing with Israel. God is putting you a place where his name will be glorified. How can God get glory if you ain't telling your story? You see, the story isn't about you. You're a character in it. The story's about God. It's about God getting glory. And God wants to get glory with your life. How many is a believer in God? How does God get glory if you ain't got a story? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Revelations 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You can't sit in silence and testify. You can't go back and forth to work and never say nothing about God and testify. When you're ready on your long way home, on this long, rough side of the mountain journey home, when you're ready to start talking about the glory of God, get ready for deliverance. Where's all my God did it people? Are there any God? I'm going to tell you something right here and right now. God did it for me. I could tell you story after story after story after story. And not only can I tell you, I'm here because of those stories. Now, I know some of you all distant, indifferent, don't care right now, but let me tell you something. Let me testify. If God hadn't pulled some strings, I'd already be out of here. I'll tell you something ignorant that I did one time. I like guns. I like hunting. I like fishing. I was fooling around with a gun one time, and I was going to play a prank on somebody and act like I was going to shoot myself. It was a revolver. Everybody knows a revolver's got that tumbler in there. But I miscalculated which way the tumbler went. I'm still here, folks. How many times God saved you from stupid stuff? Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. Y'all don't, y'all, y'all, I get God glory while I'm here. 
Some of you don't even know. This may be for one or two. You can sit there with your indifferent self, but I'm going to give God glory. I shouldn't be here. I should not be here. I did dumb stuff to my friends. Had to leave me on the front lawn of my house. That's not a bragging story. That's a give God a glory story. I'm not angry at God. I got to take the long way home. I'm glad about the long way because it was a shortcut. I'd have been out of here already. If it's a long way that's going to get me home, take me the long way. But sadly, Israel's like much of us sitting here today, fear prevails. And this is where the story kind of takes a wrong turn. Anybody ever made a wrong turn? When the armies of Egypt appear on the horizon, the Israelites realize they're in a dangerous and desperate situation, trapped between Pharaoh and the Red Sea. Egypt and water. It kind of reminds me of salvation. In order to get out of Egypt, you got to go through the water. In order to get out of the world, the, wor the, the world, the plan of salvation, you got to go through the water. Yes. But instead of looking to God for deliverance somehow, they managed to ignore the pillar of cloud that stood before them and instead became captivated by their enemy. How many are caught up watching your enemy instead of looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of your salvation? Exodus 14 tells us when Pharaoh drew near, you do know it was God's plan that Pharaoh would do this because he hardened his heart. So what the enemy is doing, see the enemy is doing exactly what God wants him to do. I wonder how long the enemy gets to do what God wants him to do for you to get to where God does wants you to, wait a minute, what I say there? It's, isn't it funny that the enemy of God is more willing to be obedient to God? Did I just say that? Isn't it funny that the God is easier to get the enemy to do what a so-called saint and believer? Wait a minute. What? Is that, is that in the Bible? Did I just read? Wow. 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 It's a sad day when the enemy is more obedient to God than us. <laughs> I told you I was going to get a little bit of an attitude today. But that's some good information right there. Put that in your pipe and smoke that bad boy. That's a good one. <laughs> Roll that up. Forgive me. Don't get mad at me. Y'all said way more stupid stuff than that before. I'm saying it for effect. You meant it. Don't make me take off my coat. <laughs> Man, I'm cracking myself up here. Y'all need this. Sister P, you got to stop laughing. <laughs> Ain't that just beat all when the enemy's more obedient than us? But <laughs> God just sitting there, my God, the enemy's doing everything I want to do, but I can't get my saints to do a thing. I just told, I just made harden their heart. I gave them the whole word of God, and they can't. I gave them a map, and they can't do it. Behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Their fear overwhelmed their faith. Do you realize just what happened to get them out of Egypt? It just ten plagues, miracle signs, light when everybody else had darkness. Uh, it's wow. How many knows that's kind of ridiculous? Let me tell you something. God isn't going to do any different for them than he is for us. So when that day comes and it's all said, said and done, it's all wrapped up, you're going to look and go, oh, God, it was so obvious. How did I miss it? Or thank God I didn't miss it. They cried out, but it wasn't a cry of faith. Instead, it was a cry of desperation. It was a fearful cry that will earn the rebuke of the Lord. Wait a minute. Let me be gentle here. 
you will earn a rebuke of the Lord if you've been given so many opportunities. And he's done so much for you, and he's got an obedient enemy and a disobedient saint. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? <laughs> Last time he cried, I got you all out. Now, you know what? It's going to take your faith this time, pal. You just go ahead and tell the children to go forward. What do you mean go? What do you mean go forward? We got an enemy. We're shot by a mountain. We got. I think it's a picture of people that struggle with the plan of salvation. What do you mean I got to get baptized? Yeah, you do. What makes this so disappointing is that they witnessed God's wonders as he brought them out of Egypt. The scripture says they marched out of Egypt boldly in verse 8, meaning they were confident and defiant of Egypt. Yet at the first sign of danger, they're panicking. Think about that for a minute. This may have been the long way home, but here they are being obstinate. That's why I don't give up on people. Even you're welcome. I'm glad he ain't giving up on me. Let me tell you something. I'm, God's had so many opportunities and people had so many opportunities to give up on me. I don't give up on people. All, 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 all the time, I'll never give up on anybody. I want everybody to go be saved. I, I'll never. But you just may not be able to do it here for your own physical safety. It just, you know, sometimes things go the way they go, but I don't give up on people because I don't want God to ever get, you reap what you sow, I don't want to be given up on because it's just sometimes, it, oh, can I get an amen with those people that know what that oh is? We know that God directed their footsteps to this very place and everything looks bad, but you gotta understand, God has you right where he wants you to be. And I believe he's challenging some of you to put your trust back completely in him and don't let fear rob your faith. You didn't get here without faith. You're gonna move from here with that faith. You gotta get back to believing God and trusting God, even if it's the long way home. Even it looks like the ridiculous. Why have I got to go do this? It don't matter. I'll do what you call me to do. Psalms 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. You know, let me tell you something. You only find this when things don't make sense. You only try to find this place when nothing else makes sense. You get yourself, you push things away, and you get that prayer life, and you talk to God. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and fortress. Kind of interesting of where they're at, fortress. My God in him, I will trust. What's happening here? Not my way, but thy way. Not my will, but thy When you get to that place, I've, I've had enough. It doesn't, it doesn't need to make sense. I just need to make sure I'm putting my feet where he wants them. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. Now, God doesn't have feathers. This is metaphorical. And under his wings shall you take refuge. He's using a metaphor. He's using anthropomorphic sayings for us to get an understanding. And I'll never forget the story of this, this forest that had been burned. Down and while the forest department was going through it, they found this great big bird stretched out on the ground like this. And they went to pick it up, and underneath it was all her chicks. And they all survived because Mama Bird sheltered her. And I believe that's just was God's way. I'll shelter you from the I'll shelter you from the storm. I'll shelter you. I'll keep you. I got you. I've always had you. I'm always gonna have have faith in me. I'll deliver you. The psalmist goes on and writes, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the presence that walks in darkness. Everybody say darkness. darkness. Nor the destruction that lays waste in me. That darkness means something. See, the problem with some of us, when things get dark, we think it's over. 
when things get to a certain point where they go, oh, it's over now. Now, I know ain't none of you ever said that, but, you know, lo and behold, yours truly. Yeah. <laughs> God delivered them. Can I tell you, he'll deliver you. Whatever you're facing right now. So the short version of this story is because I don't want to keep you long today. God brought them through. The Lord told Moses, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. Thank God Moses obeyed. He did this. The presence of the Lord, which had been before them and always leading the way, now moved behind them between them and their enemy. Talked about this the other day. The Lord just doesn't go before you. He follows up after you. He follows you. His angels camp round about you. Exodus 14 to 20, watch this. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the Israel. Thus it was a cloud of darkness to one and it gave light to the other. Wow. So that the one did not come near to the other all that night. Praise God. If you're in the will of God, you're going to get to see some miraculous things. You're going to get to experience to know. Not only that, you're going to be able to understand that God's got you even when it looks bad or even when it looks dark. God parted the waters and the children went across on dry ground. And that pillar stood there. It lit their way and it blinded the way of the enemy. They moved forward because he told them. Moses told them to move forward. I don't know about you, but walking across a seabed, Pretty cool. It's kind of interesting that uh, the parallel here, go through the water and the spirit will follow. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, and you shall see, give, go through the water. The spirit will follow. So the Egyptians pursued them. Yep. Separated by the presence of God. You'd be surprised how much the presence of God keeps you safe. That ought to be on every one of our lists to seek to walk in the presence of God. And when the morning came, the Israelites had passed through the Red Sea. An Egyptian army was following. They were in the midst of the sea. Two great walls of water on either side. The roles are now reversed. Yeah. Where you thought you were, Egypt now is. <laughs> you notice something here? Do you realize what happened? Their deliverance came at night. <laughs> God can still deliver you in the darkness. The most darkest of your times, God can still deliver you. Darkness cannot hide you from his help. When the morning came, Pharaoh and all his horsemen and chariots were still crossing the Red Sea. They got delivered at night. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians. Don't tell me he don't look down. Through the pillar of fire and cloud and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Do you realize Egypt figured it out? But the Israel should have known from first. The Lord fights for them. Can I remind some of the Lord fights for you? He went to Calvary for you. What, you think he's going to stop fighting for you now? The problem with some of us is we're fighting God instead of realizing he's fighting for us. You need to remember who fights your battles. Exodus 14, then Moses, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the waters that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots, on their horsemen. Verse 27, and Moses stretched out his hand. Isn't that amazing? Thank God for, for an obedient man of God. Yeah. Yeah. When the morning appeared, the sea returned to its depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh 
came into the sea after them. Wow. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and to the left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Now I'm going to do what I don't normally do. I normally, let's pump this up now, but I'm going to give a little bit of spiritual chastisement. Exodus 15 and 1 says, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord. Come on, ask me, what's wrong with that? Come on. Right song, wrong side. Right song, wrong side. And I'll just read the first two parts. I'm not going to go through the whole song. Then sang Moses and the of Israel this song of the Lord. And spake, saying, I will sing of the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He hath become my salvation. Understand that when you come out of it, I get it, there's going to be singing. There's going to be shouting. And there should be. There's nothing like when you come out of something. I, I get that. I understand that. And I'm pretty sure we all will. How, 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 many, how many of you mamas make a great birthday cake or something for your child, and they come up, they run and hug you, they love on you? Or you do something great and they don't realize, you know, you've been doing something great for them every day. What, they, they get all excited the night before Christmas. They don't understand. It's been Christmas every day of the year for them. You're feeding them and close. Are you hearing what? Ha, ha. You ever notice that the Bible tells children, honor thy father and thy mother? And, and pretty much the, 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 the two things, there's more, but two basic things that God tells parents to teach them and don't provoke them. There's something about the way we treat authority. Well, we ought to always be thankful to God. And I think it, it stands as a glaring, a glaring reflection that during worship service, some were worshiping and some looked like they could care less. Some were thankful and some like, well, I don't have to do that to be thankful. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. If you ever ran up to your mom and dad thankful, if you were ever really, I'll never forget a, a gentleman. And he, man, he was a good soul. He really tried hard. He was just one of those undemonstrative kind of looking around at everybody. And I remember one time he came to me just, I don't know why they're worshiping. They're as poor as church mice. I don't know why they're doing. They ain't got two dimes to rub. They ain't got a penny. They ain't got. And one day, uh, someone dropped a twenty dollar bill, and he picked it up, and he just started doing it. Too. And I said, "You worship what you love. We'll get up to go to work, but we won't get up to worship God. We'll get up to go to the restaurant. We'll get up to go work on the car, work on the truck, work in the yard. We'll get that, but to get up to work." Has the enemy got us bitter? Has the enemy got us trapped? What's he saying? Don't cry to me. Move forward. It's time you move forward in your walk with God. It's time you move forward. But it's talking about singing here. When's the last time you sang a new song? <laughs> See, here's a nobody knows the trouble that I've seen. Nobody. We don't even want to know your story, pal. You negative ninny, Nancy. I don't want that. What? What? <laughs> this is what they sing. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare... I will prepare a habitation and I will exalt. Y'all, look out. I'm preparing to have. You don't have to, but I will. You may not think it's important, but I do. You may not think it's necessary, but if you saw what I saw, if you've been where I've been, bless God, I'm going to worship God. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to be thankful to God. 
What am I doing? It says prepare a habitation. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of it. You don't feel God? Make a habitation for him. Create a place for him. Go ahead and look at someone and say, you're coming out of this. Turn to that, turn to that, turn to that stagnate and say, one day. You'll stand on the other side one day. Because I want you to consider something. How much different would it have been? if they had been singing before the Red Sea. Because I, I don't want the ten plagues to feel like chopped liver. I don't want that pillar of fire and cloud to feel like chopped liver. Because I think this is a fundamental flaw of Israel and the church today. Anybody can praise him after. Anybody can praise him after the... After the money comes in. Any give up praise and after he made a way where there seemeth no way. Anybody can praise him after God has revealed his plan and his purpose. But the real question you need to answer is, can you praise him right now? Right now. Come on, Look, I done told you when I got started today, I was grumpy and I ain't had nothing but a mess all week. Y'all don't even understand. And I'm not going to give you my laundry list of woes today. You'll just get more depressed. <laughs> Will you praise him before it all gets worked out? See, a true saint of God can worship no matter what because they understand. God is God and God don't ever change. God is God. Can I hear what? Can I, can, can I hear a witness today? Can you worship before you get what you need? Can, can you praise him before he bears the right arm of power? Before the healing comes? Before the finances show up? Before the end, can you walk in faith and say, I don't know how, I just know he will. He didn't in the past. I'm a, I've learned to walk forward no matter what because I know he's God there and he's God now. You see, the Red Sea didn't change anything about God. He was mighty to save no matter which side you're on. Now, there's nothing wrong with their song. I'm glad they praised God for what he'd done. It's just the right song, but on the wrong side. Listen, saints, let's, let's come to the music. The, faith sings before the enemies fall. Told you the other day about as they worshiped and sang, the Lord sent ambushments. I want to show you something in Psalms 149. There is a progression here. Praise ye the Lord. You know there's no qualifier there? The psalmist understands, listen, if you're going to create a habitation, you've got to start praising. Let, let, me lay, let, let me lay this down on you. If you're grumpy all the time, I don't, God don't want to be around you anymore than I do. I don't want to be around you. Sing unto the Lord a new song. And praise in the congregation of saints. This is right here. Let Israel rejoice in him that makes. See, 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 wait. Pray because he made. 
If he didn't make you, you couldn't be here to be grumpy. So why be here and be grumpy when he made you? And you'd be happy that he made you. Thank you, God. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. Oh, wait, 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 wait. See, 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 see. God ain't your puppy dog. He's not your mascot. There ought to be something about us. See, the world wants you to put God on trial. And sadly, some of you are all too well to oblige. And you're judging God by this, and you're judging God by that. And he's looking at you saying, you're judging me by everything. Well, here, let me tell you a story. Man got in an argument with God. The scientist said, man, I, I could do better than God. Just like some of y'all sitting here, I can do better than God. So he said, okay. You go make a man, and I'll make a man. And we'll see who does better. So the dude goes over there and he grabs a shovel and his wheelbarrow starts filling up dirt. And God says, hey, wait, 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 wait. What are you doing? I'm getting some dirt to make a man. Oh, no, go get your own dirt. How's that put that in perspective for you a little bit? So, can you really want to stand, be, stand before God, having sat your entire life in the seat of judgment of him? I've come to please him. I want to please him for the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Here's where it starts. Are you ready? This is the first mention of weapons. Notice we went through all this praise and all this joy and all this glory and all this singing and a two-edged sword. When you, only when you worship and praise can you wield the sword. Yeah, that's good. Amen. Don't quote the word if you can't praise and worship. That's right. That's right. Amen. The devil quotes, yeah. but he don't worship. He doesn't worship. The devil knows there is one God and trembles, yeah. Come on. but he don't worship. He quoted a whole bunch to Jesus trying to get him, but he don't worship. So understand, before you wield the weapon, before you quote the words, you better know how to worship. Yes, that's right. You better know how to sing. That's right. Don't, 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 don't talk about the word of God to me until you can worship. Don't you talk about the word of God to somebody else. Don't you get mad and sit there all stewing in your own joy before you can worship. Come on, give him the glory. Give him the glory. He goes on. Two edged sword of him. To execute vengeance upon the heathen. Thank God he doesn't want the sword in your hand to your worship. You want to talk about suicide? You'll take the word and kill yourself. Did you hear what I said? You have to understand many people. Know, I, I, I was reading somebody's writing the other day about God, and I was like, oh Lord. They have all this word knowledge but they don't know the essence behind it. And they've missed it. And they're so judgmental of God. And they're so judgmental of anything about church. You know, religion's not a bad word. It's in the Bible. It's what man have done to it that makes it bad. But still God chose man and the church. He's got pastors and teachers and evangelists for the perfecting of that. Perfecting is painful. Yes. Yes, it is. You want to know what gets the pain out of it? When you come in singing and worshiping. I'm here to please God. You can't, you can't hurt me when my purpose is to please God. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. To bind their kings with chains. Just now, just now. After praise and worship and understanding the word. Now. Now. 
enemies get bound after the singing and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them judgment written. Listen, this honor, this honor of praise and worship, this honor of bearing the sword and the word, this honor have all his saints. You see, the honor comes from being a worshiper. That's right. The honor comes from being a singer. The honor comes from I'm here to give God glory. That's right. And it ends with what it started with. Praise ye the Lord. What am I saying? If you'll begin today to rejoice in the deliverance of the Lord, if you'll start here, if you'll start now, and don't let fear rob you of your song. You know, you can keep this going, but there's an old, old song. And I'm not good at singing, and I don't know why I'm doing this again, but this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praise in my Savior all the day long. He's the author of it. He knows the end of it. This is my story and God is in it with me. This is my song. I will sing a new song. Don't lose your song in the middle of your story. No matter where your story takes me, no matter if it's the long way home, I still got my song praising Jesus all the day long. Can we stand? Can we stand? He's worthy of your song.